discuss that um, this afternoon. So without further ado, I do want to get into our first session, which is on salinity. And of course, being something that I like to talk about a lot, um, I was quite excited when our soil session um, planning committee decided that this was something that they really wanted to talk about. And so um, we've invited two people to come in and give some information to you on case studies, talking about different strategies to manage soil salinity. And so the two different case studies that we're talking about, one is on tile drainage, um, and the other one is on managing those areas with salt tolerant forages. And so of course for us, the two people we think of, um, or for me anyway, uh, to bring in, one is John Lee from AgVise. Um, and so I'm gonna just do a general introduction before you can start speaking there, John. Um, uh, John grew up on a grain and livestock farm in West Central Minnesota, and he's been providing technical support in soil fertility to AgVise labs um, in Manitoba, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana for the past 29 years. And many may not know that John is actually retiring, I believe at the end of the year, correct? Correct. Correct. And so we, we got him for one last time uh, just before uh, he was gone. And well, maybe we can drag you back in because we do that with Don. We'll see him later. He's retired. We'll never let him go either. So, um, so thank you for being here, John. Um, I also wanted to note because we were, people could hear us chatting a little bit about the deer in the back there, um, that you've also been helping uh, John Hurd uh, steal state soils in the past um, and helped him in Minnesota. And this is probably before he was a catch and release soil hunter, potentially. Um, I think he realized the error of his ways and started leaving things behind as more of a conservation effort. Um, but so John is gonna be speaking to us um, on the tile drainage side of things. The other speaker that we have that will be following John is Lyle Cowell, and he is a regional agrologist with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Um, and I don't have a big bio for Lyle, but I will say that according to his Twitter profile, he is a very large snowshoe and cross country skiing enthusiast and may or may not be Santa. So I am curious to hear more about this later on if anybody has questions for him about this. Um, so anyway, again, salinity, big issue that a lot of people have been bringing forward because we know that salinity is a water table problem. And so water management is really the only way to deal with it. We thought that we should bring these two case studies forward where we have very two different extremes in a way of how to water, uh, how to manage water, whether it's through the kind of the tile drainage aspect or using something that's actually gonna use up water and lower water table like a salt tolerant forage. So John, um, take it away. Uh, I will let you share your screen and present to us on your um, project that AgVise has been doing looking at uh, salinity and tile drainage. Okay, thanks Marla. Um, just wanna make sure everything looks and good, sounds good on your end. It sure does. Okay, so again, uh, John Lee, soil scientist with AgVise. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, uh, speak at the MAC conference. It's always fun to, to do that. It'd be more fun to be in person, but who knows, maybe, maybe next year or the year after, we'll all be there in person again. The project I'm gonna be talking about, as Marla said, is a, a tile drainage project. We started in 2019 and finished up a couple of years ago. Um, this was <clears throat> started at the, uh, with a local grower who had some uh, interest in doing tile drainage. The first tile that was put into this area was in early 2000s. Um, Grady Thorsgaard was the grower and he was a good friend with Bob Deutsch and, and we decided uh, and he would allow us to put some uh, sites out there to monitor on a yearly basis. Um, and this is just a picture of uh, the second year after uh, the tile was installed. Of course, as Marla mentioned, you know, dealing with salinity is nothing new, we, we, we see it. Um, in too many places, we know it's a problem. And then for the most part, you know, farmers will call it white alkali salts, whatever, but it's, it's something we, we try our best to manage around for best production. As Marla mentioned, it's a water table issue. And when the water table gets to within some critical distance of the soil surface, um, we have wicking of water to the surface and then the salinity, whatever uh, salinity is there is left behind on the surface. On sandy soils, that distance is maybe two and a half feet to the water table and wicking, um, whereas on fine textured soils, it might be four or five feet where uh, water is still wicked from that deep 
uh, allowing the salt to concentrate at the surface. This is just to give you an idea of where the project was done. This is a salinity and sodicity map of North Dakota. So the site here <clears throat> west of Northwood is just outside of the uh, Lake Agassiz, about two beaches uh, on the west sand side. Um, so, but it's in an area where salinity is included in many of the production fields in this area. And if you look at that map, you'll see that those uh, saline soils move right up into Manitoba um, and they're, they're an issue there as well. So the grower in this, when this project had started, he had some questions for us. He wanted to know in the short term, if he might be able to seed earlier um, or if there might be less compaction because he's controlling the water a little better. He asked about nitrogen losses because maybe if the field wasn't as wet, he'd have less denitrification or leaching losses. Those are some of the things he wanted to know about. In the long term, we, we started it because we wanted to know about salinity over time and what would happen with that over a long period of time. And of course, uh, the grower, he wanted to know, really wanted to know about increased profits and, and yields uh, that would maybe drive the profits because uh, it's expensive to put in tile. So here's some soil information about this site. Um, it's a sandy loam to a loam soil uh, texture wise. Uh, I want to point out that it's not a fine, fine soil. So that, that you need to know and, and be aware of. Um, high pH is like most of the valley, carbonates three to 6%, which plays into the IDC with soybeans and organic matter uh, four to five and a half percent. We established 10 sites uh, on this field and then we sampled them after harvest each fall before tillage was done. Just to give you an idea, this is, was a demonstration project, so there's no replication. Um, if we set it up differently in the, in the future, there would have been replication, but that's that's what we've got for data to show you. Um, and what I'm going to do here is some people like to start uh, their dinner with dessert, so I'm going to start with dessert. I'm going to actually show you the, the fruits, the pictures of what resulted from the tile drainage um, through the first several years of this project. So this is a picture from 2003. The tile was installed in 2002 and why Grady put soybeans there the first year after tiling, I don't know. We wouldn't have recommended that, but that's what he did. And you can see that the soybeans are growing better right over where the tile line was. This picture doesn't really show it really well, but there's a lot of IDC in this field as well. So uh, iron deficiency chlorosis is a combination of the effects from carbonate and salinity. And so the salinity was making the, the IDC worse. This was a picture from 2003. Here's 2004, he went to corn. Um, you can still see there were areas there that, where the corn was having a tough time. 2005, went to corn again. Um, again, a, a crop that would use water longer in the season, which is what we're trying to do. I mean, tile drainage is trying to lower the water table, but also having a crop that would use a lot of water assists in lowering that water table. 2006, went to sunflowers. You don't see too much of an issue out there. 2007, crossing his fingers, he went back to soybeans. Um, and again, the picture doesn't show it really well, but the IDC was gone. We just didn't have much IDC there in 2007 on those soybeans. 2008, went back to corn, and I actually quit taking pictures after 2008 because there was nothing to take pictures of. The production was great across the entire field. In fact, Grady said it was one of his best corn fields. So uh, that's, the end of the, that's the end of the pictures. So now let's just take a look at the data. And I'm only gonna show you data from um, two of the sites of the 10, because I'm gonna show you the two sites that started out with the highest salinity and show you what happened to the salinity over those 17 years of the project. So initially site two and site five had salt levels in the two and a half to three range. And as you can see through the years, it wasn't a straight ride all the way down to low salinity. It was a herky-jerky uh, process in some of the dry years, we actually saw the salinity levels go up. And of course, that was because there was no water moving through the tile. We still have evaporation between the tiles coming to the surface and leaving salinity behind. So in order for tile to work, of course, you need to have excess water early and late in the season for the, to push that uh, extra water and salinity out the tile. But as you can see over time, um, both of those sites then are now having salinity in that 0.5 to one range which is a big deal for crop production. You know, bad things start happening to a lot of crops when that soluble salt level gets over one. I just wanna mention that the salt test we're using here that we're displaying here is the routine one. It's the one that you would see, every farmer would see on his soil test reports 
uh, on the routine testing. The next thing I want to show you is that the subsoil salinity really didn't change much over all of those years. You can see the data where it started out at three and a half on site two and it ended up, I don't know, maybe at two and a half, but it, at site five, it kind of bumped around two to two and a half the entire time. So as you have salinity that leaves the topsoil, of course, it has to move through the subsoil and that process takes time. Um, but that did not seem to hinder the increase in crop production. Once the salinity from the topsoil was less than around, I don't know, say one and a half or even one, he could grow any crop he wanted. The, the IDC was less. So it just you know points out that if you can control the salinity in the topsoil, <coughs> that's really the most the first step to being on the way towards better crop production. Um, the subsoil salinity, of course, is a, an issue long term, um, but doesn't control as much as you might think. Whereas the topsoil salinity uh, is a bigger deal because you have issues with the tolerance of the seedlings to salinity early on. And if they can get through that you know, time period, they can handle more salinity in the subsoil, apparently based on this. I want to tell you a little bit about the rainfall. And I've kind of highlighted the, uh, the data here is there's way too much data here for one slide. So the next slide simplifies it a bit. The time of the year when you get most of your tile running would be early and late. And so what I did here was I looked at the average rainfall this, for this area for months April, May, and then September and October. I've excluded June, July, August because that's the time when the crop um, is growing. We have a lot of evapotranspiration. So tile generally doesn't run through the summertime when there's a good growing crop there. But early and late, that's when you can do leaching through the tile and, and remove some of the salinity. So if you look at the average rainfall for this area, it's about seven and a half inches through those what I call leaching months. And here's the years where we had rainfall in excess of that, you know, 2004. 2007, 13.6 inches. Though. So there was six inches above normal for those leaching months. 2010 in this area was wet early and late. 2013, and of course, the Grand Poobah winter was 2019, where we had 15.7 inches of rainfall over and above the, uh, that 7.7 inches in those early and late months. So, you know, tile is a great thing. It, it works, but you have to have rainfall um, to benefit from that for that to help with the salinity. Um, there are some trends just to point out. Um, this is the graph showing the percentage of samples that we've tested at AgBuys from different zip code or postal code areas over the last 20 years. The top line, the green line, unfortunately, is the, the 582 Grand Forks, North Dakota area where I live. And you can see the percentage of samples testing high in salts or more than one is increasing over time. Uh, unfortunately, through those wetter years, if you have wetter years, um, groundwater comes closer to the surface, more evaporation, more salinity over time. Um, the brown line is from the Winkler area. And there's been maybe a slight increase there, but, but not too much over time. At least in the last few years, it looks like it's come back down to less than 20% of the fields having more than uh, uh, 1.0 on the salts. And when you get out to the Brandon area, there's uh, in the West areas, there are less fields that have this issue. This is just a graph showing the percentage of fields testing with a salt over one in different areas of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So you can see it's it's an area we all kind of deal with and there's always a percentage of samples that we get that test over one. Now there is a thing that I think is confounding the data and as we do more zone management sampling, which is a great thing, um, I think what's happening is when fields are split up into zones, you know, three, four or five zones, they find out that, you know, one of those zones may have salinity. That's the you know, limiting factor. And what happens in reality is they don't test that zone again. It's rated as saline. There's no reason to test it again. They limit the inputs that go there. And so I think saline soils, when you go to zone testing, are actually underrepresented because there's no reason to test them again. And those areas are well defined. So in Manitoba, you're looking at the, the green line there. And so about 30% of the samples we get from Manitoba now are zone samples or parts of fields. And so I think saline areas may actually be underrepresented because of the not sampling those saline areas every year. So as a result of this project, obviously we saw the salt, topsoil salts go down over time, um, but excessive rainfall uh, was received and is required to have that salinity effect on these soils that are moderately well-drained. 
this was not a fine textured soil. If, if it was done on a fine textured soil, it would take more years to achieve anything close to this. But the grower was very happy. He can grow all of his crops there. He grows dry beans there, soybeans. And in the soybeans in particular, we see a lot less IDC issues um, because yeah, the carbonate level stayed the same, but now we've made the salinity lower and salinity adds to the severity of the iron chlorosis in soybeans. The subsoil levels really haven't decreased much. Obviously that's gonna take longer, but it hasn't deterred the much better crop production in those areas. Um, it's good to point out that salinity, even on these tiled fields can increase in drier years. So growers aren't surprised by that. And again, you need extra water early and late for the, the tile to be effective at remove, uh, reducing the salinity. From the grower standpoint, earlier seeding, yes, he only actually tiled part of this field. And uh, in the past, he had to wait for this part of the field to dry up before he could seed it. Now he can seed it because it all dries up at about the same time. Less compaction because he's not forced to be out there tilling this part of the field when the rest of it's ready to go. Of course, we couldn't document any nitrogen losses, but if the field is not um, ponded with water all the time, likely there's less nitrogen losses, both to denitrification and to leaching. Over the long term, we've measured salinity uh, decreases over time. Yep, we've got the data to show that, and there are other projects that show the same thing. Increased yield and profit, probably the best way for me to show that probably is a yes, is that Grady's been tiling more fields uh, since he saw what was improve the improvements on this field. So, um, and I don't want to forget to say that surface drainage always has to take place first before any tile drainage is even considered. Uh, if you can't get rid of the surface water, the tile drainage uh, will not help you very much. And with that, I'm done with my part. And I think they were going to wait for questions to the end, right? Yeah, um, we'll bring Lyle up and have um, Lyle present. Uh, and then we're going to do questions at the end, if that works. Uh, one quick question, though, Lyle, as you are activating your uh, screen uh, or your sharing for your presentation, uh, John, there was a question coming in on the subsoil salt measurement. How deep or what was the depth of that subsoil salt measurement? We did those as a regular test would be done. It was a 6 to 24 inch sample. Okay, perfect. All right. So what we'll do is we will have Lyle speak and then we are going to move into kind of looking at the questions at the end. So take it away, Lyle. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Marla. I'm just going to assume that you can see and hear me. Um, and let me know if I'm just talking to myself. Uh, it's <laughs> great. Thank you very much. I, again, I, as I said before, it's an honor to speak today uh, before yourself and, and with uh, the rest of the people in this panel. Some, uh, it's, thank you for inviting me. Um, introduce myself. Uh, you've uh, already mentioned I'm a regional agrologist with Nutrien up in northeast Saskatchewan. And, and it is true, I do like this cross country ski and I do like the snowshoe. And I am Santa Claus in our local community. If you want to travel to Star City, Saskatchewan this weekend, Santa Claus Day is this Saturday. Um, I was asked to, to speak to uh, some. To the topic of salinity and specifically to provide some uh, field examples on how an alternative method of salinity control or at least acknowledgement that we have to do things different in saline areas uh, can also be effective. I, I use this slide in, in other slide decks as well and, and it's just to bring a little bit of perspective to saline soil and, and how I see it on the farm. And, and to compare this, this issue with other industries, including other portions of farming. For example, if a cattleman, cattlemen are ruthless. Uh, if a cow is not productive, it is, is culled from the herd. It's for cattlemen uh, have a very good focus on profitability and deal with it as it may. I've seen it in orchards as well, in, in other, uh, in Eastern Canada, for example, where if an orchard is unproductive or if a portion of an orchard is not profitable, then that portion is just quickly removed and replaced. Outside of agriculture, if a chain in a store is losing money, it's closed. And yet, too often I see in Saskatchewan and now undoubtedly in Manitoba and, the, and in the Dakotas and Minnesota, grain farming, if you lose money, you try again. And I really believe and especially as we see increasing prices to grow crops, annual crops in particular on our land, 
it is very likely that we can actually make more money if we farmed less land. There's a lot of limits to growing crops in Western Canada. And uh, these is, this is my list of uh, what I think are primary causes of marginal soils across Western Canada. And, and salinity is the big one. It's, it's big because it has a big impact on crop yields. Its potential to fix the problem is relatively low and it is not static. It, if not dealt with, the problem can actually continue to grow. So amongst all the, the factors that can create marginal soils, salinity is certainly the primary problem. A paper from Weeb uh, back in 2006 that, uh, that uh, assessed the potential for salinity problem across Western Canada, affirmed that about, there, there are currently about two and a half million acres of saline land in Western Canada with a risk to grow, a risk to grow to five to six million acres. So it is a very big deal across Western Canada in particular uh, across Eastern Saskatchewan and a significant portion of Manitoba. And uh, certainly would grow, uh, certainly be, as we've seen, an issue south of the border as well. Now, over the past 20 years, we've done some good and we've done some bad in terms of uh, reducing or uh, increasing the risk of salinity. Over the past 20 years, we've essentially stopped summer fallowing in Western Canada and therefore stop contributing to excess uh, water to the subsoil. Uh, as John described, it's can read is, a, is the factor that leads to salinity development on, development on our surface soil. So we have lowered the risk of salinity over a course of time because of this. However, we've done something else that's bad and, and, that, and that's that we continue to encroach in marginal land for growing annual crops. Um, there, I, I think there'll be a significant market in Western Canada for forage grasses in the next five years as we start to replant the saline land that we should never start uh, seeding to start with. And we have to then give that some careful consideration what, how we're managing a farm. Uh, J John talked about this and uh, just really coming back to this topic that especially for annual crops, the entry of, of salts into the surface soil is a particular problem. Salts go up and down. They, they go up and down year to year. They go up and down through the seasons, depending on the upward movement of groundwater uh, in a, opposition to precipitation. And we hope that in the saline areas, there's more precipitation and there is capillary movement of water upward. The problem with annual crops is it becomes an annual problem in to be able to get the crops to germinate in this environment. And so we see that, uh, as John said, salts at depth are not a problem. Salts near the surface are a problem. And really then the key is to keep that subsoil uh, water as low as possible in the profile. And we can do that by really only two means. One of them John described was tile drainage and one by growing deeper plant, deeper rooted uh, annual, or sorry, perennial species that can drive that water table lower. Now we need to understand the soil side of salinity and how it develops. We also have to give a little bit of thought to the tolerance of various plant species to uh, salinity. So it's, it's a two-sided two story. It's not just understanding salinity development, but also understanding the response of, of uh, plant species to that salinity. We often see in publications this standard of uh, four millisiemens per centimeter as a saturated paste. Um, th there's unfortunately very often, people don't explain what is meant by four millisiemens per centimeter saturated paste. It's really, um, it, it's, it's a difficult and practical way of measuring salinity. And so most labs, as John mentioned, use a diluted salt to water ratio, therefore having lower numbers. So uh, John's, uh, trial uh, and that he had looked at was using a one-to-one -one ratio. And most soils, if you multiplied your one-to-one -one by about 2.2 in that range, you would end up with your actual number for saturated paste. That's all well and good. So then you have tolerance tables often in publications based on saturated paste. Well, on soil tests, we get a, a numbers given to us in a one-to-one -one ratio, and it's a little bit hard to decipher uh, for a lot of field agronomists and farmers to what the heck this all means. So uh, 
Well, it took a little time a few years ago and just uh, more or less put the equivalency of saturated pace and, uh, and crop tolerance into one table. So this table, for example, if you have a, a uh, saline soil of a, a range of 1.9 to 3.6 and a one to one, this is where things start to get serious in salinity. For example, you can expect uh, at an EC of about two and a half and a one to one ratio, you're probably gonna have some significant yield uh, loss in wheat and even some alfalfa uh, stands or selections of alfalfa will start to have some significant yield loss. And this is the range of salinity where you actually start to see the salinity, at least in period, uh, periodically uh, through the season on the soil surface. Here's a salinity. I just spoke to a farmer at a retail two days ago uh, who had uh, been told by someone that they could sell him something to remove salinity from his land. And that's impossible. Uh, it's, not, it's impossible for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that the tremendous volume of salts in a truly saline soil. We're talking about tons of salts removed per acre, not pounds. So we have to keep that in mind. So the goal then is to just keep the salts out of the root zone. And we can do this uh, as in by two means, as was already described by subsoil uh, tile drainage to leach and then uh, sub sufficient water to leach the salts to the tile drainage. Or we can use the soil subsurface water more efficiently by, and then keep the salts down. And that's best done in saline areas using uh, tolerant uh, salt species. And then we have to then uh, consider, uh, are we going to manage the salinity by variable management? And that can be done to some degree or by more, again, more uh, a bigger step in actually managing what we grow in that area. So do we move the money or do we move the crop? Um, we, can, we can vary inputs in some areas, and, and a lot of variable rate management recognizes, recognizes that salinity is a driving factor in variable yields. And so we can, for example, then vary the inputs, vary the nitrogen rate to, uh, to better uh, recognize the yield potential in that area. Uh, or we can take the next step and actually start varying what we do in the field. So taking this to a, a couple of case studies. And the first case study I'm gonna describe is at the University of Saskatchewan Goodale Farm. is in dark brown soil zone, uh, sandy loam soils. Uh, really quite a lovely soil profile. If you drive by it in, in the uh, highway, you think this looks like a quite a good uh, piece of land. Um, I was asked by, a, I've done this a few times with the fourth year agronomy students at the, at the University of Saskatchewan to just do a bit of a field study in one or one of the neighboring fields. And what I did a few years ago was, uh, again, had the, had the workforce of the fourth year agronomy students, and we dug some soil pits, we took drone images, we used NDVI images, and we did some soil samples to un better understand the yield potential of that field. This is a drone picture of the field, and right, right in the, uh, from the drone, we can see some obvious signs of sal salinity. In the lower left, we have a grassy area that is uh, very saline. And we can see that the university probably should extend the, the grass a little wider than it is now because we have salts moving out from the edge of that. And really to address uh, salinity with forages, we need to extend the forages past the level of salinity. We also see a significant amount of kosher growth uh, throughout the field. And kosher we know uh, is, is intolerant of competition and relatively tolerant of drought and salinity and so does very well in these saline areas. Comparing this to NDVI images is, is one of the relatively new tools that we can utilize to understand uh, soil landscapes. We then see that the saline areas show up very clearly as low yielding areas within this, these fields. So again, took the group of, of uh, fourth year agronomy students, divided them into groups, and sent them out across the field to soil sample. And how we did this was divided them into groups, some of them taking a NDVI map in hand and sampling only the red areas, some the orange areas, some green, blue, and so on. Then I actually took two of the groups and didn't give them a map and sent them out across the field to sample the fields 
just randomly, like unfortunately too many fields are sampled. I'm gonna focus on only the zero to 12 inch depth samples. And first of all, just looking at the chemistry. Well, uh, we knew this field was saline, uh, the stariness right in the face. And yes, indeed, it is quite saline. The red areas, the lowest yielding areas have been heavy in one to one EC of 4.7. Um, and so very, very, very saline. The blue areas, uh, even there, there's a tiny bit of salinity, but not enough to affect yield. Uh, so with only a slight salinity rating, the random sample, uh, random samples tend to tell us randomly nothing. Uh, the EC uh, from the random sample being 0.8 and a non, uh, suggesting that it's a non-saline field. So of course, we know that that random sample would be incorrect. We look at a little bit of nutrition this, in this field. Um, primarily, well, first of all, we know that most of these, well, all of the salts, all, most of our Western Canadian saline soils are, are sulfate salts. And in, in of course, the sulfate levels in the uh, most of the rare areas were very, very high, uh, the, including in the, in the random sample. Also, the nitrate levels are quite high. And that's primarily because the university, as so many farms, continue to apply nitrogen uh, not with non-variable rate application across the field. And therefore, we have residual end of, uh, being deposited or, or left behind in those areas. Now, uh, salinity varies and the plant response to salinity varies in terms of yield. And it's somewhat difficult to predict the actual impact on specific uh, species uh, to yield. However, there's an older publication by Holm that was published in 1983 and specifically was to investigate the impact of salinity on uh, various species, including annual crops and perennial crops. And I just, Using that publication, uh, it assumes that wheat yield is uh, equal to about that equation, minus, uh, 10 times the EC as a saturated paste plus 100. So uh, it gives us a bit of a reference to understand in this field how wheat uh, yield would be affected. We see using that equation that wheat yield would be very severely affected in the red areas, uh, using that equation, a yield loss of well over 80 percent. and and so on, and then blue areas with no significant yield loss. So it gives us a bit of an idea then how soil variability, salinity variability can then lead to yield variability. And if we then have variability in salinity, variability in nitrogen levels in the field and variability of yield potential, we can then start to put, put this together and, and various platforms of variable rate management do this in different ways. It's really not that hard. It, we can put together these concepts in uh, the impact of salinity on uh, yields, and we can start to estimate where are they really, how we should manage nitrogen fertilizer, not just based on the soil test, but also on the yield potential. And if we look at this then in this particular field, we, in the red circle here on the screen, uh, in the red area, the, pro the appropriate rate of N would be zero. And in the blue area, 100 and pound, about 100 pounds of N per acre, if we assess the yield potential uh, of 60 bushels a week per acre. The problem here with the random sample, a 50 bushel crop uh, yield potential, we would recommend to the farmer of 67 pounds of N per acre. So therefore, certainly under fertilizing the very productive area of the field where we're truly making income from the farm and very much over fertilizing the saline areas of the field. And so this is the basic premise of variable rate fertilizer management on these saline fields. And of course, the next step in variability is variable farm profitability. And, and there's no point in farming land that will consistently lose money with annual crops and using a very base level of $250 a, a, to grow a, a, an acre of wheat, which would probably be higher now um, we would lose money on the red areas, even though they're continually being farmed. We would be recreationally farming the orange and yellow areas and breaking even on average throughout the years. And we'd be truly making some money on a relatively small portion of the field, but in the end, actually making more money by managing those areas better than trying to farm the entire field um, as one uniform block. And then we can take the next step. Well, if we're losing a lot of yield from those areas with annual crops, 
there are species that can tolerate salinity quite well. And so if the yield loss for wheat is over 80% and canola over 80%, well, there are grass species in particular that can tolerate that level of salinity. For example, salt lander green wheatgrass, uh, an expectation of yield loss once established of really nothing, quite tolerant of that level of salinity. This then takes us to another uh, case study that I wanted to present. It's, uh, this is a case study that represents two sloughs, uh, slough one and slough two, they're well named. Um, and they, these are two sloughs that are actually on nutrient property near one of the potash mines near Saskatoon. And the, the landowners uh, nearby really wanted to see something growing there other than salinity. And so we visited these sites and they had already been thoroughly soil sampled. And I just have some of the representative soil test levels and the SAR levels, the sodium absorption ratios across the uh, a portion of this slew one. We see that with ECs of over 10 and in some cases over 20, slew one was extremely saline. And this is a picture of the first time that I visited this slough. There was nothing growing there. There was no grass, there was no weeds. All that was growing here was salts. So what did we do? Well, we planted forage grasses because nobody had tried that yet. And so we started off in this particular slough by growing a, a pure stand of saltlander wheatgrass. And only a year later, this is a superimposed picture from, one, from 2019 to 20, uh, 2020. Uh, it's not perfect, but now we have some grass growing there. This is the first step to reclaiming saline areas. Looking at an adjacent slough, this one wasn't quite as saline, but still quite saline. Uh, slough number two, we see it, the, the EC and SAR numbers here. And we took a slightly different tactic by seeding a, a blend of grasses uh, on this field to better uh, utilize the full uh, range of, of yield potential uh, among species across the saline landscape. And so this is a blend, it has salt lander in it, but there's a number of other species flowing. Uh, I unfortunately uh, did not take a picture of this slough the first time I saw it, but only a year later was a very highly productive uh, hay stand. So sort of hay stand, you know, two bushels or two, sorry, two large round bales per acre as we measure uh, hay yields so often. So it turned a, a completely non-productive piece of land into a highly productive uh, field of hay. So overall, uh, we both spoke about how soil is variable, yields are variable. Sometimes we can, we can address soil salinity by varying inputs, and that's fine in some cases, but sometimes we need to vary land use. And if we do this, if we do it appropriately, this is a win for the farmer. In Saskatchewan, we did a tremendous shortage of hay this year. We should have never have a shortage of hay in Saskatchewan because we have literally millions of acres of land that would be very well suited to hay that is very poorly suited to annual crops. It's a win for the environment, for the groundwater and, and every other portion of the soil environment. And really, it should be a bigger part of the climate conversation to convert a lot of this land to perennial species. Thank you very much. Uh, that ends my slideshow, Marla. Thank you so much, Lyle. Um, thanks to both you and John, because again, salinity is one of those tricky beasts that people have so many questions about right now um, and trying to figure out what the best management strategy is to deal with salinity it's just that much more complicated you've got some sometimes like very upfront big upfront costs with tile with limitations and then you've got some maybe cheaper options like forage even though it's not a super cheap option there's still those types of options but they also have limitations in a different way um, so i'm just looking at some of the questions here and uh, john first to you um uh, a couple of questions have come in around with tile, like where did the salts end up going or how do you deal with the manage the, the water in terms of the outflows? Well, in North Dakota, uh, maybe the same as there, there's different regulations what, what has to be done. <clears throat> At the time this was put in, um, Grady has a good relationship with the neighbors, so the, the, the water here had to be pumped. It was pumped into a local drain 
he had to clean the drain to for about a mile and a half to get the water to the Goose River is where the actual uh, water ends up. And from there, of course, the goose goes into the red and from there it goes north into Canada. Yeah, and, and then that becomes a, a big question sometimes when, especially in Manitoba, where people are having to get these drain um, applications approved, that quite often people don't, they worry about, well, if you're draining salts out and that salt is going into surface <clears throat> water, is that gonna end up being a problem? Um, uh, oh, a question came in, Lyle. Uh, comment on contamination of salt lander with downy brome. Is this uh, still a concern? There, it's somewhat of a concern. Uh, uh, there is a, there's a, in some of the sources of downy uh, of salt lander, there has been contamination with a bit of downy brome. Um, there are sources available now uh, that does not have downy brome in the seed. There's the other side of the argument that if appropriately used, uh, downy brome is not going to tolerate this level of salinity. It's, it's just not going to germinate. And so I, I think that the risk of the downy brome is a lot less than we, we think it is. Yeah, and I, I had heard the same, I think, earlier on that there was probably a, a bigger contam potential contamination problem. Um, that everybody kept saying was taken care of, but it could just be more that, yeah, it's less of a concern that it's actually gonna germinate. Uh, another question came in around the forages, Lyle. Um, when you were establishing the AC salt lander in those really high salt areas, did you ban the seed into the ground? Like how did you actually physically get that established? Uh, yeah, it was a uh, very low tech uh, seeding, but it, it's easy to seed these areas because there's very little residue to, residue to seed in. Uh, the, the farmer in this case had, a, had an older press drill, uh, and some of the older press drills are actually make very good forage seeders. So just very, very uh, shallow uh, banding of the seed into the ground. One thing that we had to try to discourage him to do, everybody wants to cultivate the soil before they seed their forages, and, and that's just the wrong, that's the it's the absolute wrong thing to do. <laughs> uh, and they all, everybody wants to cult cultivate the, 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 get rid of all the kochia and other weeds. Well, actually, we find generally the kochia actually provides a reasonable cover uh, to protect the, some of these seedlings are pretty fragile as they come out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, we've actually had some fairly good luck in these areas, just leaving the weeds. Um, once those the salt land or other grasses are established, that is the end. That is the end of those uh, weeds. So they cannot tolerate the competition that the grasses provide. Yeah, and that's a, a good point too. Um, I often get asked about dealing with kochia and foxtail barley and all that kind of stuff. And um, I was giving a presentation in southwestern Manitoba at a, one of the many field days in that area where people were wanting to talk about salinity. Uh, and somebody came up to me and said, hey, Marla, we've been listening to you for a while and you keep talking about mowing those patches down and we finally started doing it. And I said, good, because at least the coach is doing something for you then if it's growing vegetatively, not setting seed, if you can kind of control that way. Um, but this, I mean, this really does bring into the, th this conundrum, I guess, with managing these areas in a, um, in a forage where now the forage has become an obstacle to farm around versus the alternative where the drainage can happen. And now I'm trying to get that land into production and it's not an obstacle to farm around. And so this is always that, that struggle. So have you found in some of these case studies, Lyle, has that actually been a part of the discussion? Um, what other alternative options are, or were they just so wanting to get something growing there that they were okay with just putting the forage in? I think this is going to vary between the the between areas. Uh, um, as John said, you got to have some water moving through the profile to the to the drainage, or else the tile isn't going to work. And and a lot of a lot of very saline areas do not have excess rainfall on average. So uh, east, a lot of eastern Manitoba, southern Manitoba, eastern Minnesota would have, uh, even up in the area that I worked in, northeast Saskatchewan, we might have enough rainfall to, to push that, those salts through. But 
a lot of Western Canada is in a net, it would almost always be in a, in a net negative in terms of uh, rainfall. And so it, it's a farmer and an agronomist are just gonna have to think their way through this and what's really gonna work out and what the end product's going to be. Yeah, any other comments, uh, John, on the reality check on the effectiveness in this case? Well, I mean, it's, it's an expensive proposition. I mean, before the prices and everything went up, most tile was $1,000 an acre. So farmers are about making things profitable. And so there has to be a way to pay for it in the long term as well. Absolutely. And, and I think that that becomes a big, a big issue uh, in the end when we start thinking about you know, how we're going to make some of these decisions, how we choose what we're going to do, and, and keeping that reality check, I guess, in place. Because I've had people come up to me and say, oh, I heard that tile is going to get rid of my salts and their salinity is so high that I think you know, if you're, if you're investing at this so your grandkids can farm and grow, you know, that's, that's one thing, but it might take that many generations before the salt goes down enough to be able to grow wheat and canola. Maybe one Let comment, up. you know, farmers will call and they'll say, we haven't done any tiling before, where should we start? Mm -hmm. And they always seem to want to start with the worst fields, the worst salinity, the worst of everything. And I'm like, no, find a field that's just a little bit wet and with a, just a little bit of salinity, that's the one you can make money on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, there's more questions. I think you guys will both be able to see them in the, the Q&A tab um, and might be able to type some answers in to respond to some of those. But I thank you both for joining us and getting us kind of set up um, to talk about some of these soil management issues today, uh, specifically one on salinity, which I know is something that's going to be plaguing us for a long time, because that's just how things go with salt.